Um, if they're subscribed, it will, but we can put it in the, the chat as well. I hear myself on the stream. On the new one. Are we good? Okay. Um, somebody in the Slack tell Tyler to put the new link in the old chat. And then we should. Ready? Um, but I think we can just go ahead and start. Is that okay, Alan? Okay. Um, we'll just keep going. Uh, changed. Um, so hello, everyone. Sorry about all of the technical difficulties, but I think we've got it all figured out now. Um, of course, this is our last show of the year, so we're glad to have you guys with us. Um, we have two great speakers for you guys tonight, including one of our semi-regular, like non-astronomy, Astronomy on Tap Talks. Um, before we get started, I'll mention a few things. Uh, just be considerate in the chat and feel free to drop your questions at any point during either of the talks and then I will field them to the speaker at the end of each talk. Um, so feel free to drop those at any time. The second thing is that one of our former staff members has very kindly donated to us a section of space on his flash drive that will be going to a future mission to the moon. He's invited all of us that he knows to place their name on the flash drive that will go to the moon for, for free. And in addition, if you use our link, which Tyler will place in the chat, you'll be entered into our own raffle, um, where we'll also allow you to send a few pictures up to the moon as well as just your name. Um, always feel free to donate to our Venmo and PayPal. This month, we're asking you which movie featuring the famous Arecibo was better, or, you know, the sad, sad Arecibo. Um, GoldenEye or Contact. Um, and the last thing is, please like this video if you're watching. It would mean a lot to us, um, and hopefully you were able to find it okay. Sorry about all the technical difficulties. And subscribe to our YouTube channel so that we can get a unique YouTube link, and so that whenever we go live, you get a notification. Um, so first up, we're just going to go ahead and get started with our first speaker. We have a speaker who's a respected colleague of some of our very own AOT staff. He's currently doing his postdoc at UC Santa Cruz. And when we asked him what the most fun fact was about him, he said he likes to write and solve puzzles. So he's here to tell us about the puzzle he's currently working on, which is about lithium and stars. So here's Josiah. Hello. So billions of years in the future, the amount of lithium on the surface of the sun is going to suddenly increase. And so my hope tonight is to give you a flavor of how astronomers can know something like that and how it fits more broadly into our understanding of stars and their effect uh, on the universe. So when the universe begins in what we call the Big Bang, it's hot and it's dense. Uh, and in those conditions, uh, elements are produced, but, but only a few elements. And so the universe begins with a composition that's mostly hydrogen and helium and with just a little bit of lithium. But of course, our experience of the universe is, uh, involves elements you know, much beyond that. The, uh, the body of the hydrogen car here is made of aluminum and these helium balloons are floating in nitrogen and you know, the paper and the lithium battery package has a bunch of carbon in it. Um, and so all those other elements that we see and experience around us, uh, in fact, we now know came from stars. And they're produced in the lives and deaths of stars. And stars are essentially nuclear reactors uh, confined uh, by the strong force of gravity. Um, and in their interiors, reactions are changing one element to another and releasing energy. Um, but those transformed elements just don't remain inside the stars. As material is lost from the stars, both gently and sometimes catastrophically in explosions, those processed elements are given back and ejected uh, into the galaxy where the stars are living. And then that material ends up getting incorporated into the gas from which new stars form. And so is there, there's this cycle by which stars are able to enrich uh, the, the chemistry of the universe. Um, 
And tonight, uh, I'm going to tell you a very small part of that story, uh, focused in on one kind of star, stars that are sort of like our sun, uh, and one type of element. And specifically, I'm going to tell you about the element lithium. And the reason that lithium is interesting is, is actually because it's easy to destroy. And, and by easy, I mean easy relative to other elements, uh, say like helium. Uh, so if you expose lithium to temperatures of something more than you know, like 3 million degrees, nuclear reactions typically destroy that. And of course, that's far, far in excess of what we experience on Earth. But if you wanted to do the same thing for helium, you might have to heat material 30 times hotter. And so in that sense, uh, lithium, whether it's present, is often a good indicator of whether material has previously been heated to high temperatures, uh, like in the interior uh, of, of a star. And so when we think about lithium, it's often a tracer because it's one of the easiest elements and one of the first things uh, that gets destroyed by being converted to other elements. Uh, when it's, when it's heated up. Um, and so when we learn about something, and when I say we're learning about lithium and stars, uh, usually what that means is we're learning about the elements that are present on the surface of a star. Uh, and the reason for that's simple, the, the information we get about stars mostly comes from the light that they radiate and shine towards us. And that light is emitted from the surface of the star. And if you take that stellar light uh, and spread it out, like, such as by putting it through a prism where you can divide and split up all the different colors, uh, you see patterns. And here on the right side is a spectrum of the sun. And you can see all these little dark lines. And those lines correspond uh, to specific signatures of certain elements. And by kind of knowing which lines correspond to which elements, kind of like a fingerprint, people are able to take uh, these spectra and figure out, okay, what elements must be present in the material uh, where the starlight uh, is being emitted. And so in that way, we can learn about what elements are present on the surfaces of stars. And that's really only part of the story, because if you want to understand what's going on on the surface of the star, uh, it's also necessary that you understand the interior of the star. Um, and so here's uh, uh, my little uh, illustration of a star, and I'm now going to take two cross sections of it, and we're going to peer in inside of it. So on the left hand side here, uh, I'm showing the temperature inside the star. And the inside of stars is, is, is quite hot, but it's not uniformly hot. In a star like the sun, the hottest part is at the center, which might have a temperature of something like 10 million degrees. And the coolest part is near the surface, uh, and that's only six or 10,000 degrees. Um, and so in the center in these hottest parts are where the nuclear reactions are happening and where elements are being transformed from one to another. And that releases energy. And then that energy moves from hot to cold until it reaches the surface and is then is radiated out uh, as light uh, to us. And so, Thinking about the temperature can tell us where are the places where nuclear reactions can happen. Um, but material could be transformed in the center. And if it isn't transported to the surface where we can see it, we couldn't tell that it was being changed. And so again, if we look on the right-hand side and look at a, a cross section of the sun, thinking about where it's mixing, it actually turns out that in the core of the sun, uh, there's not very much mixing happening at all. And so the burning products, the fusion products that uh, occur in the stellar center generally remain confined there. But the outer layers of the sun are being mixed because they're being heated from below. And that turbulent mixing and that stirring means that the composition of the material that makes up the outer layers has been thoroughly mixed. And so if we see something on the surface, that tells us about the composition of the outer part of the sun, but not its deep uh, interior. And so this is kind of summarizing what the temperature and mixing properties of uh, are inside the sun. Um, but one of the things that we know about stars that we've learned is that stars change uh, in time. And so this is a simple uh, graph kind of indicating a few phases in the star's life. Uh, as a function of time on the horizontal axis and how bright the star is on the, on the vertical axis. 
And the way we learn about something like this is not by watching the sun change, as the sun changes very slowly, but by assembling large collections of stars of many different ages and mapping out those changes. Um, you know, the simple analogy would be gathering together you know, thousands of people and looking at them all. And by doing that, you might be able to get an idea of how human life passes, just as you might see you know, some children, some adults, um, some people in old age. You could get an idea of the arc of a human life while not still actually watching anybody get older or have a birthday. Um, and so from doing that, we have an idea that the brightness of stars like the sun changes in time. And so if we think about our sun now, which is in a phase that astronomers call the main sequence, uh, where it's converting hydrogen to helium in its core, uh, later uh, in its life, um, it's going to have used up the hydrogen in its core, and it's going to begin uh, fusing hydrogen further off center in a, in a shell in its interior. And when that happens, the change in structure leads to an increase in brightness, and the star may end up being 3,000 times brighter than our current sun. And then a little later in its life, when it's basically finished the hydrogen and uh, uh, accumulated enough helium, it transitions to a new phase where it begins fusing helium into carbon in its core, in a phase sometimes called the red clump. And there the brightness falls, and it still may be a factor of 100 uh, brighter than uh, our sun, but it's less bright than it was before. And when I'm talking about brightness, I'm careful to say here again that this is the true brightness of the star. And that's because when we think about stars, one of the most important things we want to figure out is how far away they are. Uh, because that's one of the things that lets us distinguish if something looks bright, is it actually that it's dim and quite close to us? Or is it that it's intrinsically luminous and very far away? Um, and there was recently uh, a mission uh, from the European Space Agency, uh, which looks like this uh, funny shiny top hat uh, on, on the left. Um, called Gaia, which has measured the distances to more than a billion stars. And it's actually hard to overestimate what a change that's been from astronomer, for astronomers to be able to just look up what the distance to a star is or to take collections of millions of stars and know all their distances. And in doing so, be able to figure out how bright is that star really? How, how luminous is it uh, when, it's, when it's radiating? But when we want to think about learning about how elements change in stars, it's not enough just to measure the brightness. We also need to take these spectra, to take these uh, fingerprints of, of their elements. Uh, and that's something where now we have technology where we can chemically fingerprint millions of stars. And before, uh, it used to be just that you take your telescope and point at a star and kind of one at a time take these spectra. But now what's happening uh, and is illustrated uh, in this video, is that people have built telescopes where uh, the disk being shown is essentially the focal plane where uh, light that comes into the telescope is going to illuminate it. And this robot is putting down hundreds of fibers in detailed positions that correspond to the position of the star on the sky. And so now when this telescope points at the night sky in a single pointing, it's able to take uh, not just you know, one star at a time, but say 400 stars at a time and send each of their individual light through these optical fibers and take these chemical fingerprints. And that ability to do many, many stars at once has allowed, in fact, with this specific telescope, a group in Australia, to do a survey and fingerprint more than a million stars uh, and extract, in this case, many of their chemical abundances uh, but specifically uh, their lithium abundances. And when they did that, here's what they found. Uh, so we're back to a similar graph where we're looking at different phases in the star's life. Um, but now the vertical axis is showing kind of the amount of lithium that we see on these stars' surfaces. And so on this main sequence, the place where our sun is now, uh, if you say that that's the amount of lithium we have, as we move into a further uh, phase, the phase in this red giant phase where the luminosity was increasing, um, some of the material in the star uh, is becoming hotter and lithium is being destroyed. And it's also being mixed uh, in the outer layers of the star and, the, and being mixed into material that's previously had its lithium destroyed. 
And so that process of dilution and destruction leads to a decrease in the amount of lithium uh, on the surface. And the predictions from our understanding of, of uh, the interiors of stars was that after that uh, giant phase in this next phase, after we change and the star begins fusing helium in its core, that the lithium abundance would just remain low, something like 10,000 times less than we'd had when the star was at an age like the sun. But what was discovered in, instead was that these stars had a sudden and unexpected increase of almost a factor of 100 in the amount of lithium on their surfaces. And so that's telling us that suddenly, at the time in which the structure of the star is changing, when we're changing what uh, element, what kinds of material is being fused at what location in the star, uh, that that also leads to this increase in the abundance of lithium on its surface. And so the way that we can interpret that is that at this change in structure, at this time in which the star becomes this so-called red clump star, there's some kind of mixing event it's in its interior that extends deep within. Uh, and the reason for that is that inside the interior, our models of stars tell us that there's a layer of material that's rich in the element beryllium. And if you were able to take beryllium and mix it out to a cool stellar surface, it has the property that during that, uh, during that uh, mixing, and as it moves to lower temperatures, it undergoes a reaction that converts the beryllium into lithium. And so if you have the ability to mix material from deep within the star out to the surface, you can access this material that will have become lithium by the time it reaches the outer parts of the star and so influences the light we receive. And so from doing this kind of study, we've then learned that there's a new kind of mixing inside this star. And so we can start asking questions about, does this mixing influence other elements? Does this mixing occur in other kinds of stars? And how do we think about its effect on what elements the stars are going to produce? And so then in doing so, I've told you one part, a little part of the story tonight, but then we go back to the kind of quest of trying to understand what are the processes going on in all kinds of different stars? And how do we link those processes into each of the different chemical elements that are uh, uh, made and that exist? And how do we understand where all the material around us on the earth and in the uniform universe came from? And how do we think about the time it spent in the interior of a star? Thanks. You did. Hello. All right. Very good talk. Thank you. Um, so as the MC, I get the honor of asking the first few questions. And I kind of wanted to change it up for this show. And I thought I would ask with the, just a few background questions about like you as a person, because I think that um, our speakers are really our biggest asset when it comes to astronomy on tap and like what it's really about. Um, our, our speakers, getting to know our speakers and making science a, a human endeavor is very probably one of the most important things. So I wanted to ask you just a few things about yourself. Um, so what would a typical day of work for you look like? Yeah, uh, well, so I get up in the morning <laughs> and I, uh, you know, walk 12 feet to my desk and then <laughs> sit down for about 10 hours and then uh, go eat dinner. Uh, so <laughs> before the pandemic, <laughs> um, uh, my day is usually something where um, uh, I would sit and uh, you know do some work um, uh, at the computer. So I'm a I'm a theorist. So I spend most of my time building computer models of stars. So I do a lot of computer programming um, and, and kind of mathematics. And normally my day would be doing some of that uh, interspersed with interactions with colleagues, going to a talk and learning about a new kind of observation going down the hall and asking someone how to do something. Um, you know, it's been a little more isolated uh, lately, but it's usually yeah. a mix of kind of uh, computer usage and then uh, 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 just talking with people about uh, uh, new, uh, new things in astronomy. Just out of curiosity, I mean, I know that you're one of the more prevalent developers of a very popular stellar evolution code called MESA. Uh, how, like how much time do you spend on that versus like, uh, your own personal, like, like this lithium work, how much, how much, 
how much are you spending your time on different kinds of projects? Yeah, so um, this is definitely something where I do divvy up my time. So I spend uh, probably about 60% uh, of my time kind of doing my own uh, science, like investigating, say, lithium or something like this. Um, and then I say I spend about 20% of my time uh, working on this software that Courtney mentioned to model stellar interiors, uh, where uh, I'm kind of developing it for my own purposes. And then I spend about 20% of my time working to make sure that this uh, uh, stellar uh, evolution program, which is freely available, is useful to anyone. So answering questions about how to use it or writing documentation to help other people learn how to model stars. Very nice, very nice. Um, what got you personally like into astronomy and what makes you want to do sort of like theory as opposed to what people normally think of astronomers as like an observationalist? Yeah, so I don't know, growing up as a child, I was kind of always interested in science and, and space. And I just thought it was cool. I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be an astrophysicist or, or uh, that, but, but I always thought it was interesting. Um, and I kind of knew that I liked kind of computers and, and, and technical things. Um, I kind of got interested in physics uh, more seriously in college. And then, um, I don't know, I, when I started learning about stars and kind of how we can apply the things we learn on Earth to understand what's happening on their insides, I, I just did get kind of more excited. And that's, that's stuck with me for at least a decade now. We had a speaker just um, in October, I want to say, and she said that she quoted like some study where most people who study um, like science in some way were influenced as a child by that kind of science field. So it doesn't surprise me that you've always been interested. Um, so just moving into some like general science questions. I mean, this isn't like an actual science question, but like, what's your favorite element? Is it lithium? Uh, it is this year, definitely. This, this, this year has been the uh, um, uh, 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 element lithium. And so maybe that's a, a thing too, just to say this is an example of, uh, you know, what does a project like this look like? So this was something where in July, I think, uh, I saw a paper uh, by the, the uh, Australian group whose telescope I showed reporting this new observation. And so then I got really excited and I wondered, okay, how can we think about uh, building stellar models to understand this? And so I do think that's kind of one of the exciting things about uh, astronomy is, is the chance of being able to kind of, you know, latch on to some new observation. You know, that new observation made lithium my favorite this year. Like next year, there will be new data and new kinds of observations. And so maybe my favorite element will be europium next year or so something else. And so. That is a fun uh, aspect of astronomy for me. I agree. However, I do not agree about lithium. Lithium is my least favorite element. And if you've read my paper, you know why. I hate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Stephen Dorsher asks, how sensitive are your computer models to the prior reprocessing of lithium in the universe or the primordial lithium abundance? Or does it depend more on the beryllium abundance? Yeah. So. Um, in terms of describing the entire uh, arc of a star's life, we are sensitive to the initial conditions, as was asked, you know, how much, how much lithium was there really to start? Um, uh, in terms of this kind of specific event where we think we make a lot of lithium, um, the kind of beryllium that I described as being mixed to the surface uh, comes from fusion from helium three that was already kind of around, and so it doesn't. It turns out it doesn't seem to matter very much on our starting conditions, or we think we have a good uh, handle on them. Um, so some aspects do depend on uh, kind of exactly what chemical composition we start with and exactly what happened earlier in the star's life, um, and some other things seem to not uh, depend so much. Um, he also asked, does lithium to beryllium fusion drive different kinds of convection or turbulence than hydrogen to helium fusion, or is it a qualitative or a quantitative difference? 
Yeah, so so there can be some different kinds of uh, 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 mixing caused by different kinds of fusion uh, because when you make different uh, products that have different weights, sometimes you end up with heavier stuff on top of lighter stuff, for instance, and that can lead to different kinds of, of mixing. Uh, so I didn't talk very much about the specific way in which this kind of mixing was produced, um, but the idea is actually uh, that the mixing in this circumstance may be driven by waves. Uh, at least that's my idea. And the idea would be that in this, during this time of transition in the star's life, when it's starting to first uh, fuse helium, that's often a very vigorous process. And the idea would be that that uh, vigorous kind of overturning in the star's core basically shakes things and sends waves that propagate outwards into other parts of the star and, and lead to this mixing. And so in that sense, the specific aspects of this mixing don't depend very much on exactly what the fusion that had uh, produced the elements that are being mixed out. All right. Um, Lisa Diefman asks, on behalf of Brad, <laughs> do you have an explanation for the observable lithium in only four arc of war stars? <laughs> that is it. That is a very uh, specific uh, uh, question, um, <laughs> and 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 to take a, a a step a step back, this ties into the idea of you know how much lithium there is in stars is often a probe of uh, what kinds of conditions material has been exposed to, and the sort of stars that were referred to in that question are stars that you know I know Courtney and and Brad know very well. Uh, but that are stars that we think uh, uh, went through merger events that were violent and had high temperatures. And so that might be a reason why you might expect that there wouldn't be a lot of lithium around, for, for example. Uh, and uh, the, then the more specific answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, neither do we. Neither do we. Um, and then I think the last question we have in the chat is the most important question, and it's from uh, Tabby's son, Jude. He wants to know what your favorite Pokemon is. Blastoise. <laughs> is that I, had a, I had a hollow foil Blastoise I was very proud of when I was a child. Oh, okay. Wow. You know, po collecting Pokemon cards is one of those things I was just a little too young for. Yeah. Um, but I did accidentally trade away all of my brother's good cards. He was not very happy with me. Um, so I'm sure you would be annoyed too. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and break for intermission. Um, but while we're doing that, I want everyone to like sort of, you know, do whatever they need to get, to, get themselves a drink, use a bathroom, anything like that. Um, we do humbly ask that you consider donating to our Venmo or PayPal. If you do, make sure you, in the comments, let us know what your answer is to this month's tip war. And just as a reminder, this month we're asking you which movie uh, recorded at Arecibo was better, GoldenEye or Contact? The context for this particular question is, of course, that the famous Arecibo telescope collapsed earlier this month, which is very sad. Um, so just let us know. We're you know we're trying to honor its memory as well we can, but just let us know which which movie you like better. And so we'll take a quick break. We'll be back at 7:58 on my computer, which is five minutes from now, and we'll present you with some fun space trivia that you can use to impress your friends at Zoom parties. So we'll see you then. Am I good, Alan? Sorry. I was trying not to laugh at Brad's question through Lisa in the chat. I knew he was going to say it. <laughs> also, apparently, Susan is uh, the dead name. And he prefers to be referred to as Steven.
really related to astronomy, but you know, there was an asteroid in there somewhere. Um, he knows our very own Tabby Boyajan through the TED experience and apparently has been granted a flying hug by the one and only Cher. So if, if Ken Lacovaro wants to uh, come up and I am not being heard, apparently, am I being heard through the YouTube itself? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, we can hear us. Okay, yeah. we're good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, Ken, <laughs> thanks for being here with us tonight. Do you want to go ahead and get going? Then uh, we'll have, we'll get that going. Sure thing. I will share my screen. There you go. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for hanging in there. Um, I suppose the relationship between astronomy and dinosaurs is that astronomy killed the dinosaurs. Um, so <laughs> kind of owe us an apology for that. But uh, let's talk about dinosaurs. So get my little clicker here. So I find that there is a lot of confusion uh, when I travel around the world and speak about dinosaurs about uh, what exactly they are. And so in, in biology and paleontology, we look at clades of organisms. So you find the, the ancestor of the group and you take 100% of that ancestor's descendants. And so we have an anatomical definition for dinosaurs and so we look for the, the earliest thing that satisfies that definition. And then we take all of its ancestors. And that's what we call the clade of the dinosaur. So if you have the first dinosaur for an ancestor, you are a dinosaur. It doesn't matter what has happened to you since. If you have that ancestor, you are a dinosaur. And the first dinosaur that we see in the fossil record is one called Nyasasaurus from um, Tanzania. And that is about uh, 231 million years old. Now, that probably sounds old to a lot of people, although maybe not astronomers. So I try to contextualize this by uh, stealing a trick uh, that I got from Carl Sagan, actually. And um, I got to meet uh, Sagan once, and that was a real thrill. But um, I've, I've become uh, great friends with his, um, his uh, widow. Uh, Andrean, and she actually um, uh, helped uh, support our projects in Egypt uh, many years ago and made a documentary out of them called The Lost Dinosaurs of Egypt. And she got Matthew McConaughey to narrate that. So if we condense the uh, 4.6 billion year history of Earth down into a single calendar year with the Earth forming on January 1st, well, we don't get uh, multicellular, I'm sorry, we don't get bacterial life. We don't get single cell life until about the second week of March. That's 3.8 billion years ago. And then we go until summer, until we get multicellular life, so, uh, simple things like jellyfish and sponges. And we go all the way until roughly Thanksgiving then until the fossil record really gets good. That's the Cambrian explosion that happened about a half a billion years ago. And so during all this time, uh, we have simple life, we have soft bodied life, and we still have no life on the land. So earth at this point is really almost like two earths. It's by the Cambrian, it's this uh, abundant and becoming biodiverse uh, planet under the oceans. But up on land, it probably would have looked more like Mars, nothing to hold down the sand dunes, which were probably miles high and migrated from one end of a continent to another. And then uh, finally, around the first week of December, uh, some, some simple uh, marine uh, algaes develop a little waxy cuticle around themselves and they're able to to hang out on the shoreline a little bit longer without desiccating and a little bit longer. And eventually we get land plants. And once plants are up on land, now there's something to eat. Now the animals can follow. And those earliest dinosaurs like Nyasasaurus, 231 million years ago, well, on this calendar, that's roughly now in Earth history. That's like the end of the second week of December. 
And dinosaurs dominate Earth's terrestrial ecosystems for 165 million years until they're all snuffed out by an asteroid 66 million years ago. On this calendar, that's about Christmas Eve. So the dinosaurs have this immense reign across almost an entire geological era, but that's only a, a little more than a week um, on this calendar. And then we enter into the age of mammals with the dinosaurs gone. And we don't see our hominid ancestors appear like Australopithecus, Lucy, until about 3.30 in the afternoon on the last day of the year. And then uh, our species, Homo sapiens, about 300,000 years ago, that's a few minutes before midnight on the last night of the year on New Year's Eve. And so, you know, the ball's dropping in Times Square, corks are popping, people are kissing. And that's when we show up and we look around and we kind of think it's all about us. So go back and take that first uh, dinosaur, Niasosaurus, and take 100% of its descendants. And look who is in that clade. We have all the horned dinosaurs and the, the domed head ones like Pachycephalosaurus, all the duckbill dinosaurs, the armored dinosaurs like Stegosaurus. On the other side, we have the, the giant dinosaurs like Brontosaurus, all of the meat eaters, and look who's in this group, all of the birds. Birds are theropod dinosaurs, quite closely related to these meat eaters here. They are dinosaurs because they have the first dinosaur for an ancestor. And look who's not in that group. Pterosaurs, the ornithodirons, they branch off before there is the first dinosaur. So your children's books have lied to you. Pterosaurs, which appear in every single kid's book about dinosaurs, not dinosaurs. Uh, crocodiles, not dinosaurs. They branch off before there is the first dinosaur. And mosasaurs, those big scary sea monsters, they would branch off down here. They are also not dinosaurs. So pterosaurs, not dinosaurs, but birds are, which kind of answers the age old question, what did dinosaur taste like? That's right, probably chicken. So let me introduce you to uh, my favorite dinosaur, uh, Dreadnoughtus. And this is a dinosaur that I discovered in uh, southernmost Patagonia. And I went down there uh, first in 2004 and uh, found that bone. That is about the most robust femur, the upper thigh bone that's ever been seen. It's 2.2 um, meters or about seven feet, one inches long. Now that bone was isolated, but we went back uh, the next year and, um, and found another site. This is us that same year, we're pulling some, some other kind of scrappy material that we found out of the desert. Um, this site was four miles uh, off road from the nearest town. I had to cross a glacial stream to get there by raft. And then to haul the bones out of the desert, I would hire gauchos and their horses. Gauchos are like South American cowboys. Uh, jacket the bones in burlap and plaster. You can see we padded out this sled here with uh, prairie grass, and then we haul the dinosaur bones out of the desert uh, that way. So I went back the next year, 2005, on the first day out of my tent, uh, found another two meter femur, only this time not isolated. Here you see the tibia coming out. By the end of the first day, we had 10 bones exposed, and we kept working at this site for uh, many more years, eventually we had 245 bones exposed of this giant uh, plant-eating dinosaur, what would ultimately be a new genus and species of plant-eating dinosaur. Here you can see the tail of this great beast wrapping around me here. Uh, this is its hip, this is one uh, ilium, this is the other a sacral vertebra <clears throat> inside there. This is a bit of the uh, sternal plate, the upper arm bone, the humerus is here. There were ribs that stretched about 20 feet across here. We picked those up at this point. Um, I eventually found this old junky front end loader that I was able to drive through the desert and uh, get it to that location. And I learned to drive it to save money. And uh, I always say that's about the most fun a professor can have. But um, when I talk to, um, to school groups, if there are any young people on the, uh, on the, the call tonight, um, I'd like to use this slide to illustrate um, comfort and why it's not very important. You can see uh, my state of being when I'm working in the desert somewhere. My hands are all chewed up. They're usually bleeding, they're blistered, my pants are ripped. I'm always either too hot or too cold or have food poisoning or wind burns or you know, you're just laying on the hard desert floor with scorpions under your tent at night. So you're never ever comfortable. And that really doesn't matter. 
And, you know, I can promise you that all of the most sanguine, all of the most meaningful experiences in your life will all occur while you are uncomfortable. That could be standing up in front of everybody you know and getting married or, or taking a PhD comprehensive exam or a bar exam or standing on a TED, uh, TED stage and giving a talk. Uh, you are not comfortable in those moments, but they are the moments that make your life. And they are the moments that I think you will look back on as the most meaningful parts of your life. So I always tell young people, don't chase comfort. You know, if you're sitting on the couch playing video games, eating a bag of potato chips, you're extremely comfortable. That's not a memorable moment in your life. So chase experience rather than comfort. So this is us extracting that uh, giant femur. You see it jacketed there in burlap and plaster. The four guys you see around me were not originally members of our crew. They were actually Israeli paratroopers that were hitchhiking through South America. And I needed some extra hands. So I, I went to this gaucho bar uh, about 100 clicks off the power grid, found these guys, asked them if they wanted to help me dig up a giant dinosaur. They said, what's involved? I said, well, it's really hard work under extreme conditions and I can offer you little sustenance and no pay. And they went off and they huddled in the corner for a little while and came back and said, we're in. And so they worked with us for, for about three weeks and really kind of saved our expedition that year. Great guys, we all still keep in touch. Um, so ultimately, turned out to be a new genus and species of dinosaur that I named Dreadnoughtus shrani. Uh, Adam Shran was our sponsor for uh, some of the expeditions. And, um, the name dreadnoughtus um, means dread not, right? Fears nothing, dread not. Um, and if you are the size of this dinosaur in your landscape, you really have very little to fear. Dreadnoughtus was uh, 85 feet long. It was two and a half stories at the shoulder and all fleshed out in life, it would have weighed 65 tons. That's about the mass of 13 African elephants. That's the mass of nine T-Rex that's about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. So truly titanic creature. And we got a big surprise. If I, um, if I took a thin section of your bone, I could roughly tell how old you are, or at least if you have reached what we call osteological senescence, what, if you have finished your growing or not. Um, and the reason you can tell is that when bones grow, the bones just kind of lay down cells in a very chaotic fashion at first. And then later on, they organize them. And so what you see at the bottom of this picture, those are nice organized bone cells. What you see at the top are bone cells that have been thrown down uh, very rapidly. And you see this kind of front of organization here moving in this direction. And if this was uh, uh, an old individual, one uh, in which growth had stopped, one that had achieved oste osteological senescence, you would see this organization go right out to the cortical margin here. So 65 tons and growing fast at the time of its death. We don't really know how big these creatures could get. So if you go back, you remember that uh, phylogeny that I showed you, that clade of dinosaurs, you take the ancestral dinosaur and 100% of its descendants. What well, do you see the three dinosaurs in this picture? We have a Dreadnoughtus here, we have a Stegosaurus, and we have a ruby-throated hummingbird here. And we can ask the question, which pair of these are more closely related, the Stegosaurus and the Dreadnoughtus, or the hummingbird and the Dreadnoughtus? And to do this, you look at their family tree, you look at their phylogeny, and you find what the shortest distance is. And so to get from all birds, including a hummingbird, to Dreadnoughtus, you have to go down to the ancestral Saurischian here, this would be called, and back up to the sauropods, back up to Dreadnoughtus. So that's the phylogenetic distance. To get from a Dreadnoughtus to something like a Stegosaurus, you have to go back to the ancestral dinosaur all the way down here and all the way back up. So like with a lot of science, it's not common sense, but it's true. Birds are more closely related to all of these dinosaurs, then any of these dinosaurs are related to any of these dinosaurs. So all these dinosaurs here are more closely related to each other than any of them are to any of these kinds of dinosaurs. And we can do the same sort of trick with extant creatures, with living creatures, uh, like the coelacanth fish here, a rainbow trout, and my friend uh, from Patagonia, Gaucho Ramon here, will represent uh, Homo sapiens. And because these are living creatures, we can get their DNA 
and we can test these hypotheses molecularly as well as looking at their phylogenetic trees. So we can say who's more closely related, the coelacanth and the rainbow trout or the coelacanth and humans. And so when we do that, well, coelacanths are actually sarcopterygian fish. Those are the things that eventually evolved limbs and eventually became the tetrapods that walked up on land. So all of the sarcopterygians, the tetrapods, are here, um, with the exception of this group that is the coelacanth. So you have to go down to this ancestral sarcopterygian here and back up to tetrapods, and that's the phylogenetic distance. To get from a coelacanth to a rainbow trout, you have to go all the way down to this node and all the way back up here. So it's the coelacanth and the human that are more closely related, not those two fish. And again, we can look at their DNA. There's a great um, website. This is actually a free app uh, written by a friend of mine, Blair Hedges at Temple University called uh, Time Tree. You can download this and just enter the common name of any two species and it will show you the molecular distance between those. And so if we do that between coelacanth and human, they have a most recent common ancestor at 412 million years ago. When you put in coelacanth and the rainbow trout, you have to go back to 430 million years ago to find their uh, last common ancestor. So the fish clade then includes the ancestral fish and 100% of that organism's descendants. And you see who's in that, the jawless fish and the cartilaginous fish and the bony fish and the sarcopterygian fish, which would eventually lead to all of tetrapods. So if you have that ancestor in your family tree, you're in this group. So we are in fact fish. We're highly derived fish, but anything with four limbs is in fact a fish. So you have to get in touch with your inner fish. So we are members of many nested groups. We are humans and apes and primates and mammals and reptiles and amphibians and fish. Each of us a menagerie, each of us a walking museum of natural history. And what the rock record tells us over and over, what paleontology tells us is if you learn to, if you learn to read the language of the rocks, you can go anywhere in the world and the rocks will whisper to you and they will say the same thing always. And what they will say is, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this particular way. And so it's all so contingent. Go back to the Cambrian period. And this is a really interesting period when all of the major phyla are starting to appear and you get the first macro predator, this thing called Anomalocaris, it's about a meter across, uh, but ignore those and look at this little tiny worm-like creature. It's about a centimeter and a half long. It doesn't look tough. Um, it doesn't look particularly successful. If you were to go back to the Cambrian and try to bet on a winner, you would never ever bet on this creature to be the big winner or one of the big winners out of the Cambrian, but it has some very interesting features. It has bilateral symmetry. It has its sensory organs concentrated anteriorly. It has a V-shaped muscle pattern and it has a one-way digestive tract, which I happen to think is the best kind of digestive tract. Does that sound like anybody you know? That sounds like everybody you know, right? And so if this little thing, Pikea, doesn't make it out of the Cambrian, there will never be vertebrate animals and eventually there will never be tetrapods. There will never be wombats or blue whales or kangaroos or hoary bats or you if this thing doesn't make it out of the Cambrian period. And that easily could not have been. You take this asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Well, as you well know, that formed at about the same time the rest of the solar system formed. You go out to the asteroid belt and you hit that thing with a piece of popcorn four and a half billion years ago. And 66 million years ago, it doesn't hit the earth. And the dinosaurs, which persisted for 165 million years, they don't get wiped out. Why not another 66 million more years? This would probably still be their hegemony, not ours, if it weren't for that highly contingent event. Kill off this weird looking wolf-like creature along the southern shores of Pakistan 38 million years ago. 
and today there are no whales. Or shift the winds one way or another across North Africa six million years ago and humans evolve or do not evolve as forests turn to grasslands or not. The contingencies are endless and mind-boggling and infinite kaleidoscope of things and events interacting with one another in ways that we may never fully understand. Everything matters. And the more I contemplate the improbability of my existence and of your existence, the more gratitude I feel for being alive and for being human and for living now in this amazing age of wondrous technology and ever expanding understanding. And now we're in this moment of time that has become a crisis. And, you know, humans, I think, sometimes have this feeling like we are the apex of evolution or we're the recipients of, of some cosmic proclamation of manifest destiny. It's not true. We're all freaks of nature. It easily could have been another way. Were it not for a thousand billion billion happenstances, we wouldn't be alive today. And our future is just as contingent as our past. The, the world doesn't need humans. The world will be just fine without humans. Uh, we're not inevitable. We're not entitled to the future. If we want to have a place in it, we have to fight and kick and claw for our place in the future. And right now, what are we doing? We're despoiling our environment and precipitating the world's sixth extinction. The dinosaurs died in the world's fifth mass extinction. It took out the dinosaurs and 75% of species on earth. And now we are propagating what will look to future geologists, if there are such a thing, as the world's sixth extinction. And you know, if you, if you look at the biosphere, roughly from the bottom of the Marianas Trench to the top of Mount Everest, well, that's about 12 miles, right, out of the 25,000 miles across Earth. Well, that's the, that's the dimensions of an eggshell to an egg, only take that eggshell and take half of it away and take another half away. And, and what's left, take another 40% of that. And that's the biosphere. It's just this thin little, little film of, of biotic scum, essentially, that surrounds the Earth. And that's all we have. That's all that separates us from the deadliness beneath and the deadliness of space. And, you know, we, we, we don't have a planet B. Sorry, Elon Musk. I mean, I hope we explore Mars. That would be great. We're not going to put a million people on Mars. Mars is terrible. We have a whole continent here on Earth, Antarctica, that we really can't inhabit. I, I looked it up. There have only been 11 babies ever born in Antarctica. So we literally don't even have a breeding population of humans on one of the continents on Earth where there's niceties like air and water. This little tiny rock in space, this little lifeboat, it's all we have. We have this rock, we have this atmosphere, we have this biota, and we have each other, and that's all we're ever going to have. And we need to protect it and care for it. Or the lessons of the past tell us that we're not going to be here in the future. It was Winston Churchill who said, the further back you look, the further ahead you can see. And if you look back and if you understand the lessons of the rocks, the future looks perilous indeed. So now we are the asteroid of our age, and that's not a good place to be. We've broken the Earth's ecosystems. We've broken the Earth's atmosphere. It's not going back to the Earth of yore within, uh, within the lifetime of a civilization, but now it is our job to stem the damage and to save what's left and to make this planet as, as clean and verdant and stable as possible. We don't have a lot of time. We're out of time and we don't have a lot of options. So, you know, I think it's really important for people that are in fields like mine and fields like astronomy. I, I always feel like astronomy and paleontology are kind of kindred disciplines in that we have this unrequited love with these things that we'll never be able to touch. And also, let's face it, there's no inherent value in what we do, right? We're not, we're not curing cancer. We're not inventing the next great artificial heart valve. What do we have to offer the world? Perspective, right? Perspective, some good stories, but some context that we can use to 
place ourselves on this planet and to plot our story into the future. And so I think for scientists like us, it's really important that we communicate with the public and use the expanded perspective that our science has given us to help inform people as we travel into the future. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, if you want to unshare your screen, we can get started with the Q&A. But um, you really, uh, at the end there, when you talk about astronomy being like, you know, stuff you can never touch and like doesn't have any inherent value, those are things that I, I've heard so many times as an astronomer. So mm -hmm. it's nice to hear you hit the nail on the head. Um, for our viewers, if you can't get enough of Ken, you can buy his book on Amazon or check out his TED Talk. So feel free to look at those things. Um, but I wanted to ask you a few personal questions as well, because it's sure. not very often we have a paleontologist uh, on. Um, so we want to know sort of what's a day like for you as well. So we've got a lot of astronomer experiences, but what's a day like for a paleontologist? Do you spend every day in the field? Well, I wish I did. Um, let me tell you what a day in the field is like, because that's way more interesting than a day in the office. Because, you know, like most people, I go into the office and I check email and do all that boring stuff. But, um, you know, when I'm in the field, um, I'm usually out for two, three months at a time. I, I spent a total of a year living in my tent next to Dreadnoughtus. And I always get up before everybody else does. So I walk around and I kind of kick the other tents and I wake up everybody. Um, we live very simply in the field. We'll have uh, crackers and coffee for breakfast as we walk up to the quarry, uh, break rocks until lunchtime. Every day for lunch, we have an apple, a piece of cheese and a can of tuna and then break rocks until the sun starts going down. And then we walk back to the camp. We've got chores to do. People have to gather firewood. Some people have to get water. We cook a piece of meat on a stick until the meat runs out. And then we have pasta after that. Um, so it's, it's a really simple life in the field. I love it. It really concentrates the mind. It, um, you know, it- Meditative. It is really, yeah. And, um, there was this one really uh, sublime experience that I had, and I know some of your, some of you and some of your listeners will remember uh, Comet McNaught uh, that came through only in the Southern Hemisphere in um, uh, 2007, I think it was. And, and we're out in the field for a long time, so I don't know this thing is coming. And I see like this kind of little fuzzy thing in the night sky. I'm like, oh, I wonder what that is. And then uh, a few nights later, I'm like, that thing has a tail on it. And then a couple of weeks later, bam, this giant tail. And so I got to watch this amazing naked eye comet hanging out over the quarry of the world's most massive dinosaur. It was incredible. You know, I'm a bit jealous, mostly about the comet. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think draws people, especially children, to dinosaurs? Like, I know a lot of kids are like, I want to be a paleontologist and look at dinosaurs. But what do you think draws people and especially children to that kind of thing? Yeah, most kids. I always call uh, paleontology, dinosaurs in particular, I call the gateway drug to the sciences, right? Um, and I think, you know, they're super cool. They're monsters, right? But they were real, but they can't hurt you because they're extinct. But I think, you know, it's instructive for me what what parents say, and every parent says the same thing. My, my kid, my daughter, my son, they know all the names, they know all this stuff. I don't know any of this stuff and they know, know all the stuff that I don't know. And so I think for a lot of kids, it's actually their first taste of authority. You know, like they know something their parents don't know and that their teacher doesn't know. And, you know, let's face it, you know, for those of you that are getting PhDs or, you know, that give talks like, authority kind of feels good, doesn't it? When you know something that somebody else doesn't know. And then of course your next instinct is to tell everybody, right? Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world, right? And, and that's what we want to do. But it feels good to, to be the authority on something. And I think kids really enjoy that. Fair enough. Um, and then just another question you have, you have a book, I can see it behind you strategically yeah. in your, in your shelf. <laughs> What was writing a book like? Like, how did you decide you wanted to do that? And then what was like the process? Like, what did you do for all that? What was it like? Well, I had a really short timetable to uh, write the book. I was, I was approached by an editor, an editor who saw my TED talk and said, you know, you really should expand that, turn it into a book. 
and I had a zillion other things I was doing at the time, but I said, okay. And then all of a sudden I had this book contract with a date. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I made a spreadsheet, like I need this number of words per day. And I had a chart and I would, you know, fall uh, above and below the line sometime. And I, you know, I finally made my deadline and, um, but it was great. Um, you know, when, whenever you write anything, you, you learn a lot. And um, I have a couple chapters in there about the, the origins of dinosaur paleontology. And so I had to delve into a lot of the historical literature for that and, and learned a lot by doing that. And it was also really liberating, you know, when you, when you write science papers for peer review, you have to use very dry technical language and you have to pretend kind of like you don't exist, right? Which I don't think you should do, but I, I always tell my students to, you know, use your first person pronouns, but, um, but it's, it's, it's really a dull way of writing. And this I found to be very liberating and that I could, you know, wax poetic a bit, which is nice compared to writing journal articles. Yeah, you can actually start using all the flowery language they tell you not to use. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have quite a few questions in the chat itself. So I'm just gonna start fielding those. I have some written down as well, but I think the chat questions are more important. Um, first up, we have one from April Boucher Zamzo. I hope I said that right. Um, how is it understood that crocodiles are a different clade than the dinosaurs? Like what evidence led to this understanding? Well, um, we can see in their anatomy when they have a common ancestor. So crocodiles don't have the, the requisite anatomy to be dinosaurs. That anatomy hadn't evolved yet when crocodiles, um, spread off from their common ancestor. So um, crocodiles don't have enough sacral vertebra. They don't have an open hole in their hip. They don't have an extra fenestra in their skull. Their feet are turned out, unlike dinosaurs that hinge this way. And so they don't have like the defining anatomical features of dinosaurs. And then we can see in the fossil record that you know they're, they branched off before there were dinosaurs. Now crocodiles, they, um, in the Triassic period, they were on top. And, and so the, it was the dinosaurs that were kind of scurrying around, little tiny dinosaurs like this, trying to stay out of the way of crocodiles. And in the Triassic, there were, there were some crocodiles that were eight feet tall and bipedal. <laughs> so they were like, they were scary, weird beasts. It's and like then- Donkey Kong. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and then there was a, um, the, the fourth extinction that happens um, towards the end of the Triassic for reasons that we don't really understand, hits the crocodiles harder, the crocodilians, and the dinosaurs kind of emerge from that as the dominant land vertebrates after the crocodiles take a hit. Interesting. Um, so Lisa Deepman, perhaps on behalf of Brad, wants to know what your favorite prehistoric carnivore is. <laughs> I am partial to Spinosaurus. Uh, Spinosaurus is super cool. It's a... Um, uh, uh, theropod dinosaur, big meat eater. Uh, it's about as big as T-Rex, a little uh, less um, robust, so probably not as heavy, but it has this six foot sail on its back, maybe sail. It's got these, what we know is it has six foot neural spines. They may have um, formed a sail. It's also possible that they formed a hump. Uh, I did some work on Spinosaurus in, in the Baharia oasis of Egypt, spent several winters there. And um, it lived in this mangrove environment along the southern shore of the Tethy Seaway about 90 million years ago, and it was a fish eater. And we found these giant coelacanths, actually like 800 pound coelacanths that it could have been uh, munching on. Uh, the, the type specimen, the defining specimen of Spinosaurus was found in 1911 in the Baharia Oasis, uh, taken to Germany by a, a German paleontologist, Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach. And, um, and the Bavarian Museum of Paleontology was destroyed in April of 1944. So the world was deprived of a Spinosaurus specimen for many decades. And then uh, myself and a, and a group of colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania, we went to Egypt in 2000 and 2001 to try to recover that species. And that was actually the basis for the, the Andrewian documentary that, that she made about us. Um, we didn't find Spinosaurus. I found Stromer's quarry, but in the process of looking, we found a new genus and species of giant dinosaur, which at the time was the world's second largest dinosaur. 
Interesting. I'm sure that you have a, a just a load of those kind of, we didn't find it, but we found something else. Story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, Stephen Dorr here asks, do you think the dinosaurs thought that the most advanced thing was to get bigger, sort of like how we think the most advanced thing is to get more intelligent? Nope. Um, I don't think dinosaurs contemplated the future or the past. Uh, maybe just the very immediate future, like I want to eat that thing in the future. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a mistake to think that intelligence is the apex of evolution or the goal of evolution. Evolution doesn't have a goal, it just happens. Um, and so, you know, we have these big swollen, you know, frontal lobes. And so we're, we're smart for creatures, but there are many things that we're, you know, we're not very good at. We're not very fast, we're not very tough. Um, we can't survive over a very wide range of temperatures. We have these super wimpy claws, right? And so we're, and we're not particularly numerous, not compared to, you know, mosquitoes or bacteria or things like that. And remember, when you look at family trees, you, you always see like the diagram and the humans are kind of like always at the end. Take any one of those nodes on the tree. Those are all points of 180 degree rotation, right? So you can rotate them all and make anything appear at the very, you can make it look like hamsters or the apex of evolution if you wanted to. You can rotate all the little parts of the tree that way. And if you're a gene, right? I mean, what, what does evolution do? It's really, it's a competition to make copies of genes into the future. And so if you're a gene, where do you wanna be? You don't wanna be in a human. There's only 7 billion of us, right? Much better to be in, in a bacteria or, or a mosquito or a gnat or something like that. You get a lot more copies of yourself that way. So there aren't many biological measures by which you would say that we are the most successful creatures. Intelligence is probably one of them, but uh, in, in a lot of respects, we are not the most successful. All right. Um, L Cuban 0292 asks, was there a decreasing diversity of the dinosaur fossil record leading up to the asteroid impact that might suggest they were already struggling due to their massive sizes? No, and that's, you know, that's something that like every couple years, somebody trots out a paper that dinosaur biodiversity was decreasing ahead of the KPG extinction event. And they never really have the fossil record to demonstrate that because, um, you know, not every moment in time is preserved and certainly not every moment is preserved everywhere. So if you look out your window tonight, is there sediment being deposited right now? Probably not, right? So that means that, what is today's date? That means that December 17th, 2020 will not be included in your geological record at this location, right? Um, so we don't have that kind of sampling with dinosaurs, you know, you could do it maybe with tiny marine creatures where you have um, a, a pretty constant rate of sedimentation. So these little single cell uh, organisms called foraminifera, they kind of rain down on the abyssal plains of the ocean at a constant rate. And you could say something about changes in, in abundances with an organism like that, but the dinosaur fossil record honestly stinks. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, almost all species are defined by a single incomplete skeleton. So our sample for almost all species is N less than one, right? So no, there's, I don't think there's evidence that dinosaur biodiversity was decreasing. In fact, it, it looks, if you just expand your lens a little bit longer, it looks like it's doing what biodiversity almost always does is increasing. Dinosaurs seemed like they were doing just fine. They were cosmopolitan, they were rocking and rolling, and then that pesky asteroid hit. All right. Um, we have, uh, I think, just a few more questions. Some of them are like uh, sort of you, you related astronomy to paleontology. And so the, I, there's a couple of questions about that, uh, just, just sort of drawing those same conclusions. One of them is that astronomers are often asked what the most expensive piece of equipment they've broken is. Have you done, do you have questions like that? And also, have you ever chipped or broken a valuable dinosaur bone? Um, well, our field equipment is, is very inexpensive. Like I literally buy the stuff that I need to go out and collect data for like a science paper. I buy it at the hardware store. <laughs> yeah. um, so we don't have like fancy machines to go ping and stuff like that. We do in the laboratory now where 
in my lab and in a few others in the world, we're, we're doing molecular paleontology where we actually demineralize dinosaur bones and recover endogenous proteins and blood vessels and blood cells. And we use immunohistochemistry techniques to test their endogeny. But, but generally we don't use fancy equipment. And yeah, I've broken a lot of dinosaur bones. Everybody does. Um, that's how you find dinosaurs. You work with a pickaxe and you can hear the difference between the, the rock and the bone. And if you're good, you only hit the dinosaur once with the pickaxe. Um, <laughs> And they make glue just for us. It's called paleo bond, or for really big gaps, we use an epoxy called Jurassic gel. And you know that's how you put them back together. Okay, and then the second one that sort of relates is actually from Tabby. And she wants, she says, when she meets someone, they always wanna know about either black holes or when the next big, what I assume is an asteroid is going to hit earth. Do you have questions like that that you get pretty often? Yeah, the number one question that I get, and this is why I decided to, to start my TED talk with this, is that I always get asked, how do you find a dinosaur? Um, because people imagine that it's like treasure hunting and you'd have to be incredibly, incredibly lucky to ever find a dinosaur. And that can't be the case, right? You couldn't have a career as a paleontologist if it was like finding treasure. There's a method to doing it, right? And so, you know, quickly we, we look for rocks of the right age that are sedimentary rocks that are in a desert. So you get good exposure. And if you get yourself in that situation, you don't just dig a hole and hope to get lucky. You just walk until you see a dinosaur bone sticking out of the rock. And that's what people always want to know. And then when I, when I talk to kids, they, they basically always want to know who could kick whose ass. Right? <laughs> so they, they'll ask me, you know, T-Rex or Triceratops or sometimes like T-Rex or Spider-Man. You know. Yes, yes. Um, and then, of course, the last and most important question uh, is from Jude, Tabby's son, and he wants to know what your favorite Pokemon is. Oh, man. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask my son. <laughs> <laughs> One second. <laughs> now he's actually going to ask, so that's good. <laughs> Rayquaza. Rayquaza. All right. Rayquaza. Okay. Yeah. Pronounce it. I could be pronouncing it wrong. All of them in the chat are going to be mad at me. <laughs> um, so with that, we'll go ahead and end our second Q&A session. But can I ask Josiah to come back on as well? Um, hello. So I just want to thank both of you for being here. I know there were a lot of uh, technical difficulties at the beginning. We can thank also our viewers for coming. Uh, but you, bo you both did uh, very wonderfully and gave awesome talks. So we're very happy to have you here. Um, I want to also give a shout out to our two streamers, Allie and Alex, who did their best to work through all of the technical difficulties that we had while still getting a, a show out for us. So we're very thankful to all of you because, you know, we're, we all are here trying to put this show on and, you know, sometimes things happen. But thank you guys for coming out and also for volunteering to speak for us. Um, so that's all we have today. Uh, before we head out, just a few things I'll mention. If you're watching us asynchronously and you're not live with us, feel free to still interact with the channel itself. Leave a comment, like the video, email us, reach out to our social media, subscribe to the channel. All those kinds of things are super awesome. And also like, please consider donating. Otherwise we can't put on the show anymore. Um, and then also keep an eye out on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, because that's where we post information about all of our events as soon as we have the information. And we'll see you all here on YouTube next, um, next year in 2021. Uh, and have a very happy holiday, whichever holiday you celebrate. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>